Welcome to the Inferno Cast. Today's guest is a fifth degree black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. He's also the founder of Triad Martial Arts and SSGT, which certifies hundreds of law enforcement officers every year for defensive tactics. And some of you may recognize him as Tiger Claw from the 1990s television show, The WMAC Masters. Please welcome Mr. Johnny Lee Smith. How are you doing today, sir? Great, Caleb. Good to be with you, man. Awesome. Appreciate well, you having me on. Hey, I, I appreciate you making some time for me because uh, you got a lot of great stories and we've got to spend some time together over the years. And I think that, uh, you know, it'll be a lot of fun for people to kind of hear where you came from, which kind of leads yes, to my sir. first question. Um, you know, was how did you discover martial arts as a kid? What did that look like for you? Well, um, my parents divorced when I was five and between first grade and second semester of fifth grade, um, I went to 10 different schools and, um, we did not have, we did not, you, you, you hear people say they were poor. We were so poor. We didn't know we were poor, but, um, we didn't, we didn't have anything. And so, uh, I was this poor kid and I was the new kid all the time. And I got picked on a lot and I got in a lot of fights. And so in uh, January of 1979, my mother uh, signed me up for martial arts lessons. And um, that was one month before my 10th birthday. And I fell in love with it. And it, uh, it, it empowered me to no longer be a victim uh, to a degree, obviously. And so my confidence went up. Um, I never played any sports. Um, it was weird because, you know, I had friends that knew how to play football. They knew how to play baseball. They knew how to play basketball. I got started in mar in martial arts at a young age. I didn't do organized sports. And a, a part of the reason for that was I was drug around all over the place all the time. And so when I finally got involved in something, I just, you know, I just engrossed myself in that. I never learned how to play basketball, baseball, or football. I, I didn't. Uh, I, all I ever studied was uh, martial arts. And um, so, you know, it, it, it changed my life. And um, I'm thankful that my mom did that for me. So that's, that's when I got started. That's awesome. So what kind of martial arts were you doing as a kid? I uh, started off in uh, Tong Soo Do, uh, which was a Korean uh, art. A lot of kicking. A lot um, of cool kicks in Tong Soo Do. Like, I got some friends that yeah. do that, and I dabbled in it when I was a kid. Like, you know, there's a lot of really cool kicks in that. Yeah. Well, yeah, and and the cool thing, too, was my instructor, uh, Jimmy Glo uh, Jimmy uh, Webster, was also a boxer. He, he grew up boxing as a kid. And um, so... I learned good hand techniques from him. Yeah. And then of course we had uh, several kickboxers that came through our, our studio. So we were kind of different. Uh, a lot of the Tong Sudo and Taekwondo stylists, they don't have any hands. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but in our school, because of my instructor, we, we were a school that we did have hands and our, in our, and our fighting was much more, a kickboxing style uh, than it was just point fighting. We did point fighting, yeah. But we weren't just a point fighting school. We we did we did kickboxing as well. Which I mean, that was kind of unusual in those days to see a lot of blending of different styles. You know, because up until the early '90s, I mean, it was fundamentally of if you went to a school, you learned one style, you did it one way, and that and that was about it. So, you know, for your 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 instructor to kind of have that hybrid kind of a mix thing, uh, you know, a little bit ahead of time. And, I, and I'm sure that probably taught you a different appreciation for kind of different combat styles because you weren't boxed in as much. You know, you're getting hit in the face with a right cross and a left hook, you know, sometimes yeah. wakes you up, especially, you know, sometimes the point fighting is, you know, the years went on, the contact decreased and the point and the rules increased. Um, so it's like having something that kind of kept you fresh probably gave you a very different perspective on seeking out other martial arts. Would you think? It did. And it, that, and uh, being a big Bruce Lee fan, um, 
you know, uh, one of the highlights of my life was getting to work with Bruce Lee's daughter on the set of WMAC Masters because uh, I don't I don't remember how old I was, but I got I got Bruce I bought Bruce Lee's book, The Tao of Jeet Kune Do, mm -hmm. and philosophically, I just identified with the way that Bruce thought as a martial artist. I realized he was an actor. I realized he. Uh, you know, for, for the, for the people that like to say, well, you know, Bruce Lee wasn't really a fighter. Okay. I, I understand what Bruce Lee was, but understand that Bruce Lee was a dedicated martial artist, a very smart individual. And he, he had revolutionary concepts and ideas for his time. It doesn't matter that he never fought in the ring. He had a positive impact and a positive influence on a lot of people. And I'm just one of, of probably, you know, thousands, if not millions. Yeah. And, and what I got from Bruce was you keep what works and you throw away what is, you know, useless. So, yeah. and, and, and martial arts traditionally has had this habit of hanging on to old ways and old ways and old methodologies that really don't apply anymore. Maybe, maybe those methodologies applied in hand-to-hand -hand combat at a time, but they don't necessarily apply today. Well, then they need to be cast aside um, and we need to opt into things that are relevant and things that are, have been proven to work. And I, I adapted that philosophy early in my life. And so when I saw the UFC, when I saw what Hoist Gracie did, I just immediately knew, okay, I have to learn that. Where many of, I mean, I competed, um, you know, all over the United States in, in, in karate tournaments. And so I had a lot of friends, obviously, in the karate and taekwondo world. and. I would say that well above 90% of my, my um, friends and, and acquaintances in the karate martial arts world immediately thought that's fake. Those guys are throwing the fights for that Gracie guy. That guy could never get me on the ground like that, you know, and I'm sitting there and I'm listening to this and I'm thinking to myself, no, you're wrong. You, you are brainwashed. You don't know what you're talking about and you need to learn this. Now you can learn it or you can learn it the hard way. Yeah. I mean, it's really up to you because eventually it's going to come to your dojo. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and so luckily for me, because of my influence with Bruce Lee and even my instructor, he encouraged us to learn other things. I was very open-minded, and the moment I saw what Hoist Gracie did, I said, I have to learn that. And, and truthfully, as a young man, I, I was really interested in judo. I actually, when, I, my, when my mother took me to take martial arts lessons, she took me to a judo club, and I wanted to take judo. I had never even heard the word karate. I did not know what karate was. Yeah. And... So I'd heard of judo because there was a professional wrestler named Tojo Yamamoto, and he did the judo chop and the judo flip and, right. and, and, and in wrestling, professional wrestling, and I wanted to take judo. And I had a friend, his brother had a judo book, and my friend would throw me, we would wrestle in the yard, and he would always throw me with a tomonagi. I mean, every yeah. time, every yeah. day. I mean, it, it, it didn't matter. He, he, we would get out of the yard and he had that Tomo Nagi down and he would flip me right on my back. And so I had this desire. I wanted to learn judo, but I went to the judo club and they said, well, we don't take anybody under the age of 14. Well, I wasn't even 10 yet. And, and, the, and the lady that I was, we were talking to, she said, well, there's a karate school across town. And I remember, I remember looking at my mother going, what, what did she say? What is that? Karate. I said, what is karate? I had never even heard the word karate. I didn't even know what it was. So anyway, uh, point is, I, I, I really liked 
the whole concept of the grappling arts early in my life, but I didn't have the opportunity to study that. Yep, and no so access. I went with karate and I, and I really have a, I have a passion about karate. I like it, particularly when karate is brought up to the 21st century, it's kept relevant. It's yeah. not antiquated. Um, I just, I love it. But um, man, uh, jujitsu just changed my martial arts life. I mean, it really Absolutely. did. So who um, was your first, uh, what was your first um, situation in which you got to actually do some jujitsu with like a legit person? You know, who was the first influence that was like, man, this guy knows what he's doing? Hickson Gracie. Oh gosh, at least the, the, the bar was set high. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, if you go back to, uh, you know, the UFC happened in 93, and then people started playing with jujitsu in, in 94. And so there were some guys here in Alabama that were playing around. Nobody really knew what they were doing. And, uh, um, you know, I, I would train with the, these guys and these guys over here. And, 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 I, and, and it wasn't – I just kept thinking to myself, I've got to, I've got to find a way to train with somebody legitimate in this. All these martial arts guys that are just trying to figure things out. Well, this guy, this guy did judo and this guy did jujitsu, but it's Japanese jujitsu, not Brazilian jujitsu. And, you know, so, you know, I just said, look, I'm, I'm going to go to California and I'm going to train with the best. I'm going to train with the best. And because I, I had a friend that trained with Hickson at a seminar, he got a business card from Hickson. I called Hickson's number at the time and uh, spoke with his wife. I set up an appointment to go and uh, do a private lesson with him. Um, that was back in the days we trained in the garage. And, um, and so I went out there and I trained with Hickson for, uh, I think the first time was two days and it really blew my, I, I actually, what happened was we had some friends that were attending a karate tournament. And so we, me and one of my top karate students, we went out there not for the tournament, but, but our friends were going and we were going to room with them and then go, we were going to go train with Hicks and they were attending the karate tournament. So we go to Hickson's house and we train and dude, I came out of his garage. He let us borrow his car and drive back to the hotel. And so we were, when we got in the car after that first day of training, now you got to understand, I, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm nobody special in martial arts, but I've, I've won, you know, I've won the battle of Atlanta twice, black belt division, the bluegrass nationals, the Texas challenge. I mean, I'm not a novice, but I left his garage and I thought to myself, Oh my gosh, you're horrible. You are the worst. You are not worthy of a black belt. You you're pitiful. You're a joke. You've wasted your entire life. You, this is, this is horrible. And in fact, when we got in the car, my, my student and I, when we got in the car and started heading back to the hotel, it was about a 40 minute drive. We didn't say a word to each other because we were both in shock at what had just happened to us. Cause Hickson and he was super, super nice. But I couldn't do anything with him. I mean, I could even think about doing something and he'd just shut it down, you know. I mean, it was unbelievable. And we started standing up some, you know. It wasn't like everything was on the ground. <clears throat> and so we were in shock and we were headed back to the hotel. We didn't say a word to each other. We got to the hotel and all these people are doing karate and martial arts. And I'm just walking through the hotel going, y'all are wasting y'all's time. Y'all need to go get some of what I just got. Y'all don't need to be doing this right here. This is, you're wasting your time. Go get what I just got. That was my attitude. And I admit my attitude was really bad. And I felt really bad about myself. And I felt like I had been misled. I felt like I had wasted an enormous amount of my life because this was in 1994, you know? And, and so I really was angry. And so we were sitting down at the hotel and finally we ordered our food and we were sitting across from each other. And it was Roy Manley, one of my students. 
we just looked up at each other and, and we both were like, can you believe what just happened to us? And neither of us could believe it. And so we go back to train with Hickson the next day and I pull Hickson aside and I said, Hey, I need to speak to you for a minute. And he's, he's like, yeah, what, what's up? And I said, dude, I feel really bad about myself right now. I said, I feel like I have wasted my entire life as a martial artist. I can't, I can't, I can't do anything with you. And I said, I just, I feel really bad right now. He said, look, I understand how you feel, but you haven't wasted your entire life. There are things that you have learned that are beneficial. And there's a lot of what you've learned that's a waste of time. And now your job is to become very proficient at jujitsu and get rid of all the things that you don't need, you know, that you don't need. And, and he said too, he said, understand that when you become proficient at jujitsu, your stand-up fighting will get better. He said, isn't it true that in the back of your mind as a stand-up fighter, you've always been concerned about someone getting you on the ground? And I said, well, yeah. He said, well, how do you think you're going to perform as a stand-up fighter when your attitude is, I don't care if we go to the ground. That's fine with me. You're going to have more confidence, right? And I said, yes. He said, look, you, I understand what you're going through. Don't worry about it. Just train jujitsu. And, and remember, get rid of what's useless. Keep what's beneficial. And um, man, Hickson changed my life. I mean, he really did. Um, you know, he has a he has a high place in my life um, of, of people that have been pivotal in my life. And he, and, and I love him like a brother. And, um, and, and, uh, you know, I just think the world of it and, and he, because he, if it hadn't been for him, I don't, I don't know as a martial artist where I would be today, honestly. Yeah. Um, so he, he, he deserves a ton of credit. Yeah. Well, I mean, and it's nice to hear that type of perspective and mentorship story because sometimes, you know, the, the Gracie challenge, rumors and stories and, and how it was kind of propagated back in those days to spread the art kind of polarized it where it's like well no it's jujitsu or nothing but whenever you you listen to the people that trained with those guys and had the relationships you know that they were very interested and respectful of other styles as long as it fit into like the fighting realm that was like hey you know if you're a good boxer that's going to correlate with jujitsu very well if you can get it to work you know just like his conversation with you um because you know sometimes because what they were trying to do is like spread this ideology and help educate people and show them the effectiveness, which there's a little bit of entertainment that has to go with that, you know, just like, you know, anything else when you go to an MMA show or what we're seeing on TV with the UFC, like there's an entertainment factor that goes into it. But it, at the core, you know, there's that kind of that martial artist um, perspective on things of, you know, blending and, and growing and creating new ideas and, and just evolving. So that's, that's awesome that uh that you know he kind of intersected with you at the right time at the right place and at that age to kind of give you a different perspective on it um because i had a very similar thing happen i remember the first time i ever did any grappling didn't even know what it was and i just was like i've wasted my whole life man i was just, yeah, I just <laughs> it took yeah. me but it took yeah. me years like there was years of resentment and and frustration um and it, it took me finding the right coach because uh, there wasn't really a lot of, like you said, there wasn't a lot of people doing grappling. And when I found the right coach, he was able to kind of help me, you know, shift my perspective and, and utilize some of those old things, you know, just the physio, the physiology part of it, you know, like there, there's some stuff in there that was positive, um, but just not near as much as I would have hoped, especially with jujitsu. Right. Uh, so when you got into jujitsu, you come back home, what did the training look like? for the first few years whenever you didn't have any training partners and you're having to fly across the country to get, you know, education, what did that look like? Well, uh, you take what you learn, you go back and you take your top students and you show them everything, you know, and then, uh, you, you just build from there and you try to make them really proficient at what you know. And, and, and a lot of it, you're back in those days for me was trying to figure things out for myself. And then I had this notebook and it was, uh, it was very thick. And anytime I had a question, I would write that question down. And then when I would have the opportunity to be with Hickson or with Carlos, 
I would ask questions. And, um, and actually, first several years that I trained jiu-jitsu, I wrote every single technique down in a notebook. Because back in those days, there, I mean, when I started, there was dial-up internet, yeah. but there were no instructional books. There were no instructional DVDs. You, you either trained with an, an instructor or you didn't, you, you didn't have access to the information. And so uh, I, I, I have to find that notebook one of these days. I, I'm pretty sure, certain it's in the attic, but there's just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of techniques. And, and I remember the last time I looked at it, I didn't even understand what I had written. You know, I, I read it and I'm like, I don't even know what that means because it had been so long, you know, and I was trying to describe what I was doing and it was, you know, but, but anyway, I think even though, even just writing it down, even if, if you go back and you can't understand what you wrote down, if at the time you write it down, there's benefit um, to, to doing that because it, you're, you're, you know, you're refreshing your mind, you're thinking through step-by-step step what you're doing. And I, I think that really helped me a lot, but, we would just do the best we could, but, um, you know, in 1990, 1994 was the first time that I trained with Hickson. I had a, in 95, I had scheduled an, a, a, a training session with Hickson and he was in uh, Japan and he was doing some business negotiations there. And so I was supposed to go train with him. And Kim, his wife at the time, called me and said, you know, Hickson's in Japan. He's not going to be back. And he wanted me to call you and tell you that he knows you already have your plane ticket and your hotel. And it, he, he wanted me to tell you to go train with his cousin, Higgin, Machado. Well, at the time, I had heard of the Machado brothers, but I didn't know them. And, 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 and you have to realize that at this point in time, Hickson and Hoyce and Horian had gone their separate ways. They were, you know, they were no longer, you know what I'm saying? And so, and, and I don't want to talk about that, but, uh, so, so what I did was Higgin had a school in Redondo beach and, um, I went to Higgins school in Redondo beach, trained with him for a week. And he said, you know, I've got a brother, Carlos, who uh, is in, um, he's in uh, uh, Dallas. And, um, and, and, and I say 95, it may have been 96. It's in that time frame. I, so, you know, but anyway, he said, my, my, my brother has, you know, he's teaching on the set of Walker, Texas Ranger. He's got a little gym and he's teaching, uh, uh, you know, for Chuck. Uh, Norris and uh, you sh he's a lot closer to Alabama than I am and so he gave me Carlos's number and uh, I called Carlos set up a, a private lesson with him uh, actually a semi-private I took some students with me and the first time that I ever trained with Carlos was on the set of Walker Texas Ranger and that happened because my session with Hickson got canceled he sent me to Higgin and then Higgin sent me to Carlos. And that's kind of how that whole connection happened. Yeah. I was, I was going to ask how you guys met. Cause uh, yeah, I met Carlos probably in, it was probably Oh two Oh three. And I'd been doing a little bit of grappling, like no gi stuff, like thought I knew something, you know, for about mm -hmm. two or three years. And I remember showing up down there and he had a guy that was my size in, in the class. Cause you know, I never got to train anybody that was a lightweight. There's only a couple people grappling. And I can remember thinking, oh, man, this is my moment. Like, I'm going to show these guys what I know because I've been working hard and, like, I know some tricks. And, oh, my gosh, I just got hammered because I'm thinking, like, oh, I'm going to train with Carlos Machado. And I'm going to show him my moves. And so I'm about to grapple a student. I was like, I got to show him that I know what I'm doing. And, oh, man, it was terrible. Like, I had no clue. I'm flopping around like a fish. And, you know, it was just – It tells you what you didn't know, right? Oh, absolutely. Because I just <laughs> hadn't been around any, like, real high-level jiu-jitsu yet. Um, yeah. There was a couple VHS tapes, you know, of, like, Eric Paulson and, like, like a Mario Sperry and some old stuff. And they were all, like, copies of copies of copies. So they were snowy. Um, mm -hmm. and, and we were trying to train and do some stuff. But, uh, but I remember when I was there – I had to catch a taxi to the school because I was there for business. 
I remember Carlos was like, no, man, don't worry about it. Like, I'll take you back, you know, and I'll pick you up in tomorrow, you know, tomorrow to train. And he was just so good to me. Um, and to this day, we are such good friends. And I actually talked to him yesterday. Um, he's just been a really good friend and mentor in my life and just kind of set me on the right path. And he's like, this is what you need to be looking for out of coaches. And, and that's really what kicked it off when I started kind of traveling all over the place with, with different athletes and stuff. Cause he was just like, man, you got to find, this is what you're looking for. And I'd never felt what this was until then. So it definitely right. put me on a good path. He's, he's been a good influence. So Car Carlos is uh, Car Carlos is a, obviously a pioneer in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and he is just such a wonderful person. Uh, he's a fantastic instructor. Um, but more importantly, he's just a wonderful person. Um, yeah, I just, you know, he's got a place in my heart too. Uh, I have tremendous respect for him. He's a brother. Um, you know, I just, I can't say enough good things about Carlos. He's, he's been so good to me. And, and, and not only that, but Carlos has been more than kind. I mean, to my, to, I have one of my, my top black belt is Daniel O'Brien. Mm -hmm. And um, Carlos and Daniel are very close. And um, Carlos has always just really praised Daniel and built him up. You know, he's, he, 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 he's good at building you up and making you believe in yourself and having a positive mindset. He's just a very positive person. And um, he's really, really been supportive of Daniel. And, and I just appreciate everything he's always done for us at Triad. He's, he's, he's an awesome person. Absolutely. So when did the television intersect with your career? Like, was that a plan? Was that a goal? Like, man, I can do it. If I see these guys doing it, was it by just circumstance? How did that play out? Well, um, again, a big influence on me was Bruce Lee. And um, I got the movie bug at age 14, probably. And so I liked competition. And, and I liked, I liked, you know, getting in there and going against someone else. But I had this other thing in mind at age 14 up and it was, and it's a competition too. And the competition was, I want to be in movies and television, just like everybody else does. Right. <laughs> And, 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 and you're competing to get there, you know, you're competing to be accepted, you're competing to be that person. And I knew that competition, particularly on the NASCA circuit, the North American Sport Karate Association circuit, I knew that um, if I were gonna get picked up for a martial arts TV show, because I live in Alabama, uh, martial arts TV show or martial arts movie, I needed to go to NASCA and I needed to win and, and, and be seen because I, know, I knew that producers and directors went to these big tournaments, particularly the Battle of Atlanta, the Bluegrass Nationals, the Diamond Nationals. They go to these tournaments and they look for up and coming talent. And so really what motivated me to win in tournaments was to be seen to actually uh, have an opportunity to be on a, on a show. And, and I say that, don't, don't think that I didn't like competition. I did. And I want to beat people just as, as badly as you do, right? I mean, I love, I love the competition. But it was the end goal that was really driving me. And the end goal was I want to work on movies and television. And I didn't really care if I, if I starred or if I did fight choreography. I, I didn't care about that. It was just, I want to work in that field. And I saw competition as a way to, to, to get me there. And um, I actually, the first film I ever worked on was a, a film called Body Snatchers with Lee Ermey and Forrest Whitaker. Um, it was filmed here in Alabama. And I, I ended up getting a speaking role in that film. Uh, and it was just really all by chance. I mean, you know, it just, it's just one of those things that happened. But, when I won the uh, when I won my division at the Battle of Atlanta in uh, in 1994, uh, Pat Johnson was at that tournament. He's uh, Pat Johnson. Um, he taught um, 
ne uh, Liam Neeson karate, Priscilla Presley, Steve McQueen, um, Scott Bakula. He, he was the fight choreography for um, the original Ninja Turtle films, all the Karate Kid films except for the latest iteration. Right. Um, Mortal Kombat. Um, he was in the big brawl with uh, Jackie Chan. He was in Enter the Dragon with Bruce Lee. Pat Johnson was. And, and so Pat is one of the most, you know, renowned fight choreographers in Hollywood history. Well, he was at the Battle of Atlanta. He saw me win my division and he chose me to be on the WMAC Masters TV show. And, and again, go back to what I said earlier, what I saw was karate competition. There's no money in it. You're losing money going to karate tournaments. And I didn't have a lot of that. Okay. You're going because either you just got money to burn and you like competing or you're going with a long-term plan, which is what I did. Mm -hmm. And man, I was mowing grass and raking yards and picking up cans and crushing them and everything I could do in teaching martial arts to fund my way to go to tournaments as a kid. And then I kept that up through 1994. And then when I, you know, when I got that, uh, that spot on the show, okay, that's, that's what I was shooting for. You know, I, yeah. I, I don't, I don't care to go any further in competition, you know, so. That kicked it off, I, which I mean, there's a lot of people that have been picked up that are like major, major film stars on those circuits that, you know, I think sometimes people don't realize, um, cause I can remember whenever I was younger, you know, doing MMA and things of that nature and fighting Thai boxing and stuff. And you would hear the guys in the circuit be like, how are these tournaments getting thousands of people to show up like over in Atlanta, you know, or over in Tennessee, um, you know, because nobody could figure out like what was the draw. But when you look at it from that perspective, it's like, man, I mean, about every Hollywood martial artist kind of came through a lot of those circuits. Like that was kind of where you showed what you had to get picked up for TV and film. And, you know, it just, uh, that, that was a major part of it that I think a lot of people just didn't realize that weren't in those circles. Um, cause I mean, there's just a laundry list of talent that that's exactly how they got discovered. So that's really neat. Um, oh yeah. Especially the people that are behind the scenes, like, like Chris Casamassa and, um, um, Christine Bannon Rodriguez. And just, I mean, there's a long list of, of people that may not be in front of the camera, but mm -hmm. when you see the star of the movie throw a kick, it's that kick is being thrown by somebody that, that won a big NASCAR tournament or yeah. one many big NASCAR tournaments. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that's just, yeah. that's just the way it is. Yeah. Well, so after your TV film career and you've been doing jiu-jitsu for a long time, how did this merge into the law enforcement? Because I mean, really that's what you do now predominantly is most of your time is spent with law enforcement. Um, you know, you have a, a, a huge program that's all over the nation. What was that transition like? What kind of triggered that in your career? Well, I had police officers that were training with me at my dojo and they would ask me what I thought was strange questions about self-defense. Like, um, okay, how do you get out of a headlock or how do you, you know, how do you deal with a bear hug? Cause maybe they'd been training and we just hadn't got to that yet. And they were new. And I remember thinking, wait a minute, you've been through the police academy, you're a police officer. You don't know how to stop somebody from tackling you to the ground. You don't know how to deal with a bear hug. You don't know how to deal with a headlock. You don't know what to do if somebody gets you on the ground and gets on top of you. What in the world are they teaching you on the police academy? And the short story is they were taught uh, a couple of strikes, a couple of pressure points, how to put handcuffs on someone. And, and at the time, they were just not taught how to defend themselves. And so there's this huge huge uh gap of training that police officers weren't getting and it was it was essential for survival and what they did get was very bad in my opinion so i just saw i had finished my i had kind of I'd finished my film career so to say tv film and i was i wasn't looking for another project but i had the opportunity to do something different and I saw that there was this massive need. And so I just, in 1997, I put this uh, template together for a class 
we did a um, we did a pilot class in 1997. All the cops loved the the, the training that we that I was giving them. And then uh, in 1998, I taught my first instructor school, and now it's 2020, and we're in seven states. Um, uh, we we do all we train all of Home Depot's corporate security guards nationwide. Um, we're we're the biggest defensive tactics program in the Southeast. Now, mm -hmm. when you get outside of the Southeast, there's there's other things, but if you look at the agencies that use our program and use it and teach every year, um, uh, we're we're by far the biggest in the Southeast. Uh, I would say conservatively 25,000 officers receive our training every year through the instructors right, that, yeah. that we train. You know, I don't train that many people obviously, but um, so, you know, the way that I feel about that is this, and, and you can identify with this Caleb, you've taught martial arts for years. And I would say that the majority of people that you have trained have never needed what you had to teach them, right? Absolutely. I mean, I, and I, when I say need, you know, I mean really need, right? Yeah, the real deal, like but, had to actually save their own life kind of thing. Somebody's trying to get them. Yeah, minimal, exactly. very minimal. It, 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 yeah, very small number. And, and it was the same for me. It's the same for every martial arts instructor. The majority of people that you teach self-defense to, martial arts to, they'll never, ever need that. Now, that's not to say that it's not important. It's not to say that what you're doing and what I'm doing and if I'm running a dojo is not important. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is for, for most of them, what they're going to use their martial arts for fitness, for, to build their self-confidence, for competition. That's, and nowadays, particularly with jujitsu, that's really the driving force. I'd say for a, a fairly substantial percentage of people doing jujitsu and staying with it is they want to compete, right? Well, if you, if you look at the law enforcement community, it's not like that at all. In fact, when you teach defensive tactics to law enforcement, there's an excellent chance that what you train that officer to do, there's a, a really, really high chance that they're going to need it. If you talk about the lower level of things like handcuffing, well, they're going to use that regularly. But if you, if you look at, the self-defense side, hey, I, I need to save my neck. Cops are going to need that far more often than, you know, Jimmy Joe walking down the street that might, wants to come in and take martial arts lessons from you. So because there's this dire need within the law enforcement community, I looked at it and said, I can really make a difference here. I can, I can really save lives and and make a difference not to say that my 20 some odd years teaching in the dojo that I didn't make a difference because I believe I did but it's different you know in the dojo the biggest difference I made was I improved people's confidence and and with kids I improved their self-discipline their respect their sense of honor and honor for themselves and honor for other people I did change lives but it's totally different in the law enforcement community. And I feel like it's, it's, it's very much needed and I'm just honored to do it. And, and, and I'll tell you, I've met, and you know this cause you, you, you've done law enforcement training yourself. I've met some of the finest people in the law enforcement community. I mean, you know, you turn on the media and it's bash, bash, bash when a cop does something wrong. And then the picture that, that they attempt to paint is all cops are bad. And we, we, we see that regularly. But here's the truth. The vast majority of law enforcement officers are fine, upstanding, uh, respectful people who are just wanting to serve their community and do a good job. And that is a fact. And you know it. Um, and and it drives me insane. This mindset that think of it like this. What if we applied this standard to every other group where 
one out of that group does something wrong and then we try to place blame on that entire group. Well, we wouldn't accept that. We don't believe in, there's no such thing as community guilt. I mean, you, you know, you're responsible for your actions as an individual. But when it comes to the law enforcement community, can you believe what these cops are doing? These cops? Now, I know of a cop that did something wrong and he's going to be held accountable. But what are you talking about these cops? You know, and so I think watching the battles that they face over the years, the battles they face in the media, the battles they face at home trying to keep their home life together, the battles they face out on the street to stay safe. I, I really, I, I don't know how they do it sometimes. I, I really don't. I, I, I often say to myself, why would anybody become a cop nowadays? I'm glad they do. And it's, a, it's an honorable profession. And I love those guys and, and girls for doing that. But I'm just thinking to myself, what you're going to go through to serve your community is just it's reprehensible, you know, and and so I think I think seeing that too motivated me. You know what? These people are being persecuted. I'm in the fight even more. I'm even yeah. more motivated to help you folks because I see what you have to put up with, you know. And so I didn't mean to get on a the soapbox there, but there's a lot of reason. There's a few reasons why I started this. There's a lot of reasons why I'm still doing this. Because now all I do is train law enforcement. I don't teach in the dojo. This is my life. This is my, this is my, you know, commitment is to the law enforcement community. And um, Daniel O'Brien runs uh, the dojo that I started, uh, and he does a fantastic job. So the dojo's in fantastic hands. Yeah. I'm allowed then to focus on um, keeping law enforcement officers safe, doing their job, and I just, I, I just. I'm honored to do it, man. I, I'm, you know, it, I'm, I'm just, uh, it's, it's humbling. It's humbling when people want me to come train them. Even now, you know, I've been doing this a long time and I'm like, you know, it feels good that you want me to come train you. I'm, I'm glad. I'm thankful for that because it lets me know that I'm still making a difference. Cause the moment I quit making a difference, my phone's won't quit. It's going to quit ringing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, so, and I have to say too, that, you know, a few years ago, we branched off into firearms and I brought on Jack Neville's uh, sergeant. He, he retired sergeant major in command of the John F. Kennedy special warfare center. Um, Jack is, he's a fantastic uh, 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 firearms instructor. A uh, lot of time in, in, in the real world, uh, chasing bad guys, doing things that need to be done. He's and uh, real deal. You know, he's a, yeah, he's, he's a real deal. And, and, and he's a fantastic human being. And, and he's really added a lot to SSGT. Uh, I think SSGT has really benefited um, tremendously by bringing him on board. He's really helped us a lot. And I feel like we've helped him too. I think yeah. it's been a very good mutual relationship. Um, and, and so uh, I'm just tickled that he's on board with us. Well, I mean, and that's kind of like what the mantra, the, the martial arts mantra is, is where it's like, it's the communal growth of individuals with different talents and potentials um, to influence people in a more positive way, you know, whether it be from an education standpoint or a character standpoint, like, I feel like that's the underlying, um, you know, tenet of martial arts is that, you know, helping each other grow and, and your passion and commitment to law enforcement community, especially over the last, you know, 10, 15 years has definitely been very evident, um, you know, because you're definitely an advocate for them and, and trying to help educate them and, and just pour into them because they do serve our community and, you know, and there are challenges and there's political struggles that happen with, with cops and agencies and mistakes happen because we're all human, but um, all we can do is keep trying to make each other better. And I feel like that's what you're, you're really doing with your program is you're trying to pour into these agencies. You're trying to make them better, give them some tools, give them some access to information to keep them safe and keep other people safe. You know, I mean, the better they get at their job, the safer the people they have to get a hold of are as well. Um, Cause it's ironic that, um, so Scott Kahn is a, he's a TV movie star that, that he's on this uh, Hawaiian 5-0, um, but he's a jiu-jitsu black belt. So we got to talk a couple days ago. He trains. Now that's, my, that's the actor Michael Kahn's son, right? Or James uh, Kahn's son. Yeah, yeah, James Kahn's son. Yeah, yeah, that's him. Okay. And I was talking to him because we were talking about jiu-jitsu, and that's one thing that he had mentioned was 
he loves the fact that he can protect himself and his family without hurting somebody because he came up boxing. He's like, you know, used to, if you had to defend yourself, you had to like put somebody unconscious. You had to punch him in the face a whole bunch. He's like, I just love the fact that I can take control of a situation with very limited damage to somebody because he said, it's not always going to be, you know, life or death. Sometimes there's an in-between and that makes me, and that really made me think about law enforcement where a lot of times you're just trying to get a hold of people. They just need to calm down. You know, things got, people got excited. There's something happening, but just being able to kind of get a hold of people and keep them safe and yourself safe, which, you know, with your jujitsu influence and your program structure, that's really what you're trying to do is give people these tools, especially in the law enforcement community to where it keeps everybody safer. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, that definitely is definitely noticeable. Um, you know, very much appreciate what you're doing for the community. Cause uh, you know, I mean, I'm, with our friendship, you know, I'm very aware of kind of what you do for that group. And, and I know that they value it um, as well as people that, you know, kind of see what you're doing. Um, I just really appreciate you taking time to talk to me today. Uh, I know you're busy, a lot of stuff going on. I did want to finish with though. So what was it like having Daniel O'Brien walking into your school and in your life? Cause every, you know, people that do know him know he's a unique cat. Um, so I'm just kind of curious. Say that one know, more time. I said, what was it like having Daniel O'Brien walking into your school and kind of being in your life? Because uh, the people that know him know he's kind of a unique cat. You know, he's he's a unique What's individual, that? super talented. He does a great job at the school. He's a phenomenal competitor, um, but he definitely beats to his own drum, which that's what I love about him. So yeah. how was that been, you know, being his coach and, and his friend and just having him in your life? Well, I will say this. Um, his – he used to he he has two brothers it's josh is the youngest then it's daniel's the middle boy and then john is the oldest and they used to watch me on television when they lived in new york city and they were huge fans of wmac masters and uh i think they moved to kentucky or somewhere and then they moved to alabama they moved to coleman alabama and they literally did not believe that I was Tiger Claw because they watched me on TV in New York and their, and their thought process was, well, there's no way Tiger Claw's in Coleman, Alabama. You know, there's no way. And <laughs> so anyway, short story is their mother signed them up. Uh, she got them training. Um, all three brothers were very good. Uh, they all got their black belts in karate. and then. Um, John, the oldest, and Daniel got their black belts in jiu-jitsu. And um, uh, Daniel, uh, and, and look, I love all three of the boys, but I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about Daniel. No offense to John and Josh. Love y'all too, brothers, but he asked me about Daniel. Um, Daniel is, um, I will say that one of his strengths is he's coachable. He does not act like he knows everything. He's a searcher. He searches for efficient ways to do everything. And I've always uh, really, I've, I've drilled it in his head. There's a lot of things I've drilled in his head from the time he started. He started with me when he was 13 to 14 years old. And one of the things that I drilled in his head was you, defense is number one. That, that, is, that is your foundation. Defense is number one, all right? Um, and, and anybody that says defense is for suckers doesn't know what they're talking about. And we can have another whole show about that sometime. But, but anyway, I've always instilled in him defense is number one. Um, and then also I've, I've encouraged him to have an open mind and be coachable. And Daniel has always done everything that I've asked him to do. And, uh, I, I also have told him that, I want you to be better than me and your job is to see what I couldn't see, hear what I could not hear and do what I could not do. That's your job. I, that's, that's your responsibility. So your job is to take everything that I've done and you take it to the next level. I expect that of you. And I think he's done that. I mean, you know, he's, he's pretty awesome. And he's just a, he's a very honest person. He's a very hard worker. He loves his wife and his son and he loves his students. He's a very sincere person. So 
Um, Daniel is just, I, I can't say enough good about him. He's an awesome human being and he's a great representative of jujitsu and, and particularly triad martial arts. That's awesome, man. That really is a, that's cool. You know, just to kind of see you go full circle where you, you, you know, you, you were a martial artist your entire life and you're trying to learn and get better. And then you have these students and those students come up and then those students start having kids and then they kind of, you know, they take over the mantle. Um, cause you know, that transition has to happen, but being able to keep that relationship with the leadership and, and still being close with you and still understanding that sometimes it's not always the physical wisdom of I will get out there and choke you 37 different ways and do 50 rounds to show you who's boss. But it goes almost, you know, to like a, you know, a, a mentor relationship of being on the outside, just some perspective. And sometimes it's just the mileage of life where, you know, I, I look to my coach a lot of times I'm calling about stuff. that's not martial arts related. You know, I'm like, <laughs> Hey, I'm dealing with this thing. You know, it just, uh, the relationship grows and it expands. And I think that having the perspective of somebody that's been through that age or been through that generation when you're trying to be a competitor, you're trying to be a fighter, you're trying to do this, just to give you a perspective on the long play that's, you know, like longevity of your body, you know, take care of your spine, keep your neck okay, like don't let this happen, don't overtrain, make sure you do this, like just that wisdom of being there and have and, and done that, even though it might look it may have looked a little bit different when you did it. It was still fundamentally the same thing that you can kind of just help avoid some of the the mistakes that, you know, you made when you were younger and, and just trying to pass on that knowledge because you still have to, you know, fail forward fast. You're, you're still going to fall on your face and you need to, but not to the degree to where it starts costing you longevity of life. You know, the time you can be right. an athlete, you know, things of that nature, just uh, a little bit of been there, done that. So I oh, always yeah. appreciate those relationships and seeing that with athletes and, and their coaches and, and just you yeah. know, getting to know where you came from because the 90s was the pioneering of BJJ. And to be involved in that is always an amazing story to, to hear you guys talk and, and just your experiences and, and having to travel across the U.S. to get information and, and everybody being like, oh, you're crazy. This will never go anywhere. So it's, oh, yeah. uh, it's good yeah. to see it come full circle and come fruition. Um, I really appreciate you taking time today. Is there anything you'd like to finish with? Well, I appreciate you, Caleb. I appreciate what you're doing. I think you're a great representative for martial arts and, uh, and uh, glad to call your friend. Absolutely. Anything I can ever do for you, let me know. Yes, sir. We'll definitely stay in touch. Thank you. All right. Thank you.